Griffin, the Invisible Man, escapes from Ipping and goes to Port Stowe with Marvel, the Tramp. Newspapers are publishing his stories and Griffin is committing crimes one after the other. Eventually, Marvel deserts Griffin and escapes, but Griffin catches him. After hurting him grievously, he takes refuge in Dr. Kemp's house. Dr. Kemp, on knowing that Griffin was his college mate and a brilliant student of chemistry, commits himself to protect him. He, however, wants to know the idea and process by which he became invisible. Griffin tells him everything in detail. He makes a cat invisible. And then, in order to escape his landlord's ire, he sets his house afire and sneaks away. Now, unaccustomed to his invisible movement and remaining without clothes, he faces some difficulties. He also makes some fun out of his newfangled form. In the beginning, when I stepped down, Kem, unable to see my steps, I stumbled twice. Even gripping a bolt with invisible fingers seemed clumsy. I took fun in a wild impulse to jest, to startle people, to clap men on the back, fling people's hats astray, and generally level in my extraordinary advantage over other men. One day, I was hit violently from behind by a basket of soda water siphons. The man carrying it was so astonishment that I could not help laughing aloud. <laughs> I snatched his basket and ran across the road. A cabman, a lord by an easy gain, came running to hold it and hurt me grievously in the air. I let the basket down with a smash on the cabman. People began gathering from shops, and vehicles stopped. Fearing detection, I slipped into Oxford Street. It was a bright day in January, and I was stuck naked. <laughs> and the thin slime of mud that covered the road was freezing and the roughness was hurting my feet. Then, with a sudden impulse, I ran around and got into a cab. We crawled past Muddy's, and there a tall woman with five or six yellow-labeled books hailed my cab, and I sprang out just in time to escape her, shaving a railway van narrowly in my flight. At the northward corner of the square, a little white dog ran out of the pharmaceutical society's offices and incontinently made for me, nose down. Dogs perceived the scent of a man moving. This fruit began barking and leaping. Then I became aware of a blare of music, a number of people advancing out of Russell Square, red shirts, and the banner of the Salvation Army. <sighs> Happily, the dog stopped at the noise of the band hesitated and turned tail, running back to Bloomsbury Square again. Two urchins then began following me. One said, See him! See what? Why? Them footmarks? Bear? Like what you makes in mud? It's just like the ghost of a foot, ain't it? What's up? Feet! Look! Feet running! Everybody in the road, except my pursuers, was marching with the Salvation Army. When the footprints appeared no more, they also went away. Then, to get shelter from the snow, to make myself covered and warm, I entered Omnium's, a big departmental store. My sole object was to go away from snow, procure clothing to make myself a muffled but acceptable figure to get money, and then to recover my books and parcels where they awaited me. Then I might hope to plan. And then, I had a brilliant idea. I turned down one of the roads leading me to Omniums, where everything was, clothes, food, shelter, comfort, everything. I began to feel a human being again. And my next thought was, food. Upstairs was a refreshment department. And there, I got cold meat and coffee. Finally, I went to sleep in a heap of down quilts, very warm and comfortable. Then, in the morning, in the brighter part of the department, I saw two men approaching. I scrambled to my feet 
as they noticed a figure moving quickly away. One cried, Who's that? Stop there! I sprang to my feet, whipped a chair off the counter, and sent it whirling at the fool who had shouted. Then I rushed up the stairs. Up the staircase were piled a multitude of those bright-colored art pots. I swung around, plucked one out of a pile, and smashed it on his silly head as he came at me. The whole pile of pots went headlong, and I heard shouting and footsteps running from all parts. Then came a cook in white to give me a chase. I turned and picked a lamp and hit him as he came closer. Down he went, and I crouched down behind the counter and began whipping off my clothes as fast as I could and came out without coat, jacket, trousers, shoes and to remove my skin-fit lamp's wool vest. I went to Bedstead storeroom. This way, policeman! The policeman and two of the shopmen came around the corner. He's dropping his plunder. He must be somewhere here. I went to the Bedstead storeroom and got rid of my vest after infinite wriggling and stood a free man again. I remained in the Emporium until about 11 o'clock when the snow had thawed as it fell and the day was finer and a little warmer. Exasperated at my want of success, with only the vaguest plans of action in my mind, 